Hey, what's up, everybody? Good morning. How are you? This is Sean, Sean Downs, Sean for Science. And today we are going to be talking about the mathematics of the Lie group SU2. Earlier, we discussed the Lie group SL2C, of which SU2 is a subgroup. It is, in fact, the subgroup of matrices who conjugate the identity uh, and leave it preserved. In other words, it's the set of matrices U such that U dagger U is equal to the identity. The Lie algebra of SL2C was the complex span of the three physicist sigma matrices, sigma 1, 2, and 3. The Lie algebra for SU2 will be the real span of those same sigma matrices. Let's define the operators j sub i equal to sigma i over 2. And the commutation relations satisfied by the Lie algebra of SU2 are simply ji with jj is equal to i times epsilon ijk jk. Here epsilon, of course, is the totally anti-symmetric object with three indices, and i, of course, is the square root of minus one. Today, we're going to be filling kind of a pedagogical void between a more formal treatment of SU2 using roots and weights and all of that stuff, and kind of a more slapstick, slapdash, physicist, kind of quantum mechanics driven uh, discussion of SU2. Uh, we're going to look for something in the middle, and we're going to specifically talk about the uh, representations, the unitary representations of SU2. And our main technology will be um, quadratic equations and two-dimensional plots. <laughs> we're doing it this way because it will allow us to discuss um, the representation theory of similar groups like SU11 and SP2R, which are also subgroups of SL2C uh, in a much more expedient way. So look forward to that. But today, today is all about SU2. And if you are not totally familiar with SU2, let me hopefully motivate it for you with a, a couple of reasons. First, in physics, it shows up all the time because SU2 is a double cover of the kind of group of rotations continuously connected to the identity, you know, the special orthogonal matrices in three dimensions. Um, rotations show up all the time in physics, so it's not surprising that SU2 does as well. But additionally, the set of local symmetries that describe the weak nuclear force are also represented by SU2. So there's a lot of reason to study this group. Arguably, SU2 is also kind of the simplest non-abelian Lie algebra worth discussing, and it's the archetype for um, how you would go ahead and build other representations of other Lie algebras and Lie groups. So it's, it's worth to study these technical details uh, in detail at least once. So to that end, we're going to move on and set us up with a set of four exercises to kind of get the blood flowing and to, and to do basically the bulk of the calculations in group theory for us right now. So let's start off with uh, some exercises in the Lie algebra of SU2. So first, even though we made this big stink about SU2's Lie algebra being the real span of the sigma matrices, let's go ahead and define the complex linear combinations J plus or minus to be J1 plus or minus I J2. And taken together with J3, they form kind of the so-called Chevalier basis for the Lie algebra of SU2. And it will be extremely useful in what follows. So the first exercise worth showing is that J plus with J minus is equal to twice J3 and that j3 with j plus or minus is equal to plus or minus j plus or minus. These relationships will be handy in what follows. Uh, the second exercise is kind of representation theory specific, and we're going to be talking about the quadratic Casimir Q, which in this case is given by j1 squared plus j2 squared plus j3 squared. But if you recall our discussion about SL2C earlier, you realize that it's really just kind of the uh, metric that we discussed on the uh, on the Lie algebra for defining, you know, invariant hyperplanes <laughs> uh, <clears throat> of R4. So great. <clears throat> defining Q in such a way show that Q commutes with all of the j sub i. And hence, of course, that they commute with j plus or minus. Finally, our third exercise in Lie algebra is to verify that Q can be represented explicitly in terms of j plus or minus as j plus or minus plus j3 squared minus or plus j3. That relation in particular will, will help us extensively dis to discuss the unitary representations. The, our fourth exercise will take us from the Lie algebra into the Lie group via the exponential map, works, which works really well, especially for the case of SU2. So let's define an element of the Lie algebra, say, H, where H is equal to alpha dot sigma or alpha dot j, if you like, where alpha is some vector in R3. We're going to define the Lie group element U to be the exponential of I alpha dot sigma, or I H 
or i is the square root of minus 1. Uh, this is the physicist convention. The mathematicians would absorb that factor of i into the definition of alpha. And the exercise specifically is to show that u can be represented as or is equal to cosine of alpha plus i sine of alpha times the unit vector alpha dot sigma. Here, of course, alpha without a vector on top is just the magnitude of said vector. Okay, great. So now we're going to go on to talk about the representation theory of SU2. And to do that, we're going to need to first discuss about what a representation, or more precisely, a unitary representation is. So to that end, let V be some Hilbert space, which you might recall is a vector space equipped with an inner product. And that inner product can be used to define a distance function on V. Uh, and that distance function um, with V creates a, 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 if you like, a metric space, and v is complete with respect to that distance function uh, as a metric space. So note also that that inner product is helpful in defining our concept of, uh, of Hermitian conjugate or, you know, adjoint. So first, a unitary operator on v, just, a, just any operator on v that you like that happens to be unitary, is one that preserves this inner product. So what I mean by that is, let f and g be members of v, then the inner product of u of f with u of g must equal the inner product of f with g. Um, following the rules for the adjoint, we simply pull u from one side of the inner product to the other, so we see that f with u dagger u acting on g must equal f with g, which means that u dagger u is equal to 1, which is our defining relationship for a unitary matrix, a unitary operator, in this case, on v. So to make contact with the Lie algebra or Lie group, let u be a member of SU2, um, which acts as a unitary operator on V. And let's say that it's continuously connected to the identity uh, by a small parameter epsilon, where epsilon i is a vector in R3 that's, whose magnitude is, is, is epsilon. So we can expand uh, and throw out the terms that are proportional to epsilon squared um, and see that, indeed, an infinitesimal group transformation is actually given by the Lie algebra, again, our operator h that we had considered earlier, uh, parameterized, of course, by a small value of epsilon. Plugging this into the inner product, we see, since, again, we can only take to first order in epsilon, we find that such an h is actually self-adjoint with respect to the inner product. Now, this comports, of course, with our notion of uh, self-adjoint matrices or complex conjugate transpose matrices h or sigma that we'd considered earlier. And clearly, the j sub i that we've been discussing are self-adjoint. Now, j plus or minus are not because they're complex linear combinations of the j sub i. Because j sub 1 and j sub 2 are self-adjoint, they are related by this concept of adjointness by complex conjugation, um, so that the adjoint of j plus is equal to j minus, and the adjoint of j minus is equal to j plus. Great, so now we have a sense of what unitary operators are, we're going to specialize to the case of SU2 acting on V. Now, the operators Q and J3 are simultaneously diagonalizable because they commute. So let's consider eigenfunctions or eigenvectors of V uh, with respect to both of these operators, and we'll parameterize them by their eigenvalues or the spectra of those operators, little q and little m, where little q is the eigenvalue of big Q and little m is the eigenvalue of J3. So this sets us up for our first claim. Define f plus or minus to be the action of j plus or minus on these eigenvectors f of q and m. We claim that either f plus or minus vanishes or 1, the eigenvalue of f plus or minus with respect to the operator q is again little q and with respect to j3 is m plus or minus 1. Proof. Well, q commutes with everything in all of the j's, so that part is trivial. So all that remains to be seen is j3. So we hit f plus or minus with j3, and by the commutation relationships of the Lie algebra, we find simply that yes, in fact, the eigenvalues, the j3 eigenvalues of f plus or minus, are given by m plus or minus 1. So in other words, the spectrum of the operator uh, q is kind of universally fixed uh, for a given set of vectors, but you can get between them by hitting with the operator of uh, j plus or minus, and the spectrum of j3 is just integrally spliced units uh, of, of m. So in other words, 
m, m plus 1, m plus 2, m plus 3, whatever. So you have this one-dimensional lattice of allowed eigenvalues. And so we're done. So now let's look at what unitarity, what the constraints of unitarity mean for these representations and for these, uh, these eigenfunctions. So let's pick out an eigenfunction f of q of m again, and let's just suppose that it's normalized uh, in some capacity. So we've learned that f plus or minus uh, relative to this f of q m either vanishes or is also an eigenfunction, eigenvector of q and j3. So let's go ahead and compute the inner product of f plus or minus with itself. So by the requirements of unitarity, the requirements of the Hilbert space and all this kind of thing, that inner product should be greater than or equal to zero. So j plus or minus on f of qm with j plus or minus on f of qm, we pull the j plus or minus to the other side, which gives us j minus plus j plus or minus f of qm with f of qm. And as you have already shown in the exercises, we can rewrite this in terms of the operators q and j3, which immediately gives us an expression in terms of the eigenvalues of q and j3. In other words, unitarity of these operators requires that the inner product of f plus or minus be greater than or equal to zero, which requires that q minus m squared minus plus m be greater than or equal to zero. So this gives us two constraints on the space of possible eigenvalues q and m. So let's go ahead and plot those constraints on the mq plane and see what we get. So what we see is we see two parabolas defining the saturation of these inequalities. And just kind of by inspection, we see that, well, we, very large q is allowed for very small m. So clearly, we're having both of these parabolas divide the plane into two parts, an allowed region and a disallowed region. The allowed region is above the parabolas. And so the intersection of the two allowed regions creates a wedge type shape for us that we'll simply refer to as the wedge, uh, starting at the origin and, and moving up along the boundaries of the two parabolas. This region defines kind of the allowed eigenvalues of the operators q and j3, or at least allowed by the unitarity bounds. Okay, great. So this brings us to our next claim. So the, the irreducible representations of SU2 are indexed by some number L, which belongs to the set of numbers n by 2, where n is some natural number. Uh, specifically, the, eigenvector, uh, the eigenvalues q are l times l minus 1, and the allowed values of m are kind of the subset of that one-dimensional lattice that span from minus l to l. Proof. So this is the big deal. So because q commutes with all of the operators of the Lie algebra, we know that each individual q defines its own irreducible representation, or at least every irreducible representation of SU2 must have a fixed value of q. So the spectrum of J3 are that, that lattice, and because the J plus or minus operators can take us all the way along that lattice, we see that each one-dimensional lattice, in some sense, represents an irreducible representation of SU2. Great. So now we kind of have a sense for where the irreducible representations are. Now what we have to do is intersect that lattice with that allowed wedge in the space of eigenvalues that's allowed by unitarity. Uh, and that will give us the, the distinct irreducible representation. So... For a given value of q, there is a minimum value of m that is allowed, given by the inequality, and a maximum value of m that's allowed, given by the other inequality. These are points on the parabola that intersect with the wedge. Now, if q is equal to m max squared plus m max, if it's on that parabola, in other words, then the operation of j plus on f of qm vanishes. And not only that, it's going to vanish for every subsequent application of j plus as well because j plus with zero is, of course, zero. So in other words, it gives us a truncation of the lattice from the right. So put differently, if the eigenvalue of m is such that it's between m max and kind of 1 minus m max, somewhere in between there, the eigenfunction f of qm acting with j plus uh, will take us outside of the unitarity bounds. In other words, j plus will constantly take us outside uh, of the unitarity bounds and will therefore not be a unitary representation. So put differently, we require that the maximum value of m be fixed as the value on the, on the parabola itself. Similarly, m minimum, the minimum value of m, must also be the value fixed on the other end, other end of the wedge uh, on that parabola, so that the operation of j minus on f of q m min uh, vanishes as well, and any subsequent application of j minus also gives us zero. Because if it was just off by just a little bit, it would continuously take us out of the allowed region and would send us all the way out to infinity um, in a non-unitary representation.
Now, as defined by the rules of the algebra, m max minus m min must be a natural number. And so using the inequalities, the saturation of the inequalities, the defining relationship, if you like, for m max and m min relative to q, we find the relationship, which essentially gives us the allowed spectra of eigenvalues. So let's go ahead and parameterize those spectra. Um, so let m min just be m and let m max be m plus some natural number r. So then we can expand the left and right hand sides of that constraint equation. And we find a quadratic equation that we can solve for r. You can solve for r, you find that r is equal to minus one, which is counter the hypothesis, so we throw it out. Or r is equal to minus two m, minus two m sub min. So in other words, we find that m max is r over two and m min is minus r over two. And more specifically, the eigenvalue q is given by r over two times r over two plus one. So anyway, to complete our proof, we simply define L to be equal to R over two and we're done. Hooray. Okay, so what we've shown here is that the spectra of allowed irreducible representations of SU2 um, are parameterized by the values Q and M as given uh, in terms of L. Um, but what we haven't shown is how you might go ahead and explicitly construct them, but we are already out of time. So we're gonna do that in another video. Thank you so much for watching and have a great afternoon.